Good evening and welcome to the Sport and Exercise Medicine Conference Series tonight on female health and performance in sport. My name is Matthew Wilson. I'm Head of Sport and Exercise Medicine here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Amal Hassan, who is a Sport and Exercise Medicine Consultant. We have a stellar lineup of speakers this evening on this very important topic. Uh, the format for this evening will be that we have three pre-recorded talks but we'll have live Q&A uh, after each talk. Um, I encourage you to put your questions to our speakers in the chat box, uh, and Dr. Amal and I will screen those and we'll ask relevant questions after each talk at the end. And then after the third talk, we will pull all of our speakers together uh, and have a group discussion on any questions that we may have missed throughout. So uh, without further ado, I pass over to my colleague, Dr. Amal, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and I just want to say I'm, I'm so delighted to be able to introduce two fantastic speakers and colleagues of mine to you tonight. Um, and that so many of you were interested and invested enough in female athlete help to sign up and to join us this evening. So our first speaker, Dr. Georgie Bruinvels is a research scientist and the female athlete lead at Orico. She is honorary senior research fellow at UCL, consultant to a range of sporting organizations and a passionate advocate for the improvement of education and care for female athletes across the world from grassroots to the professional elites. She's one of the go-to applied scientists for all things hormonal and menstrual health and we are so grateful that she could give up her evening to be here with us today. Thank you, Georgie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. And I am really excited to talk to you all today. Um, this is a topic that obviously I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really good to be able to share my my thoughts, some of the research we've been up to, others have been up to in this space. And I guess my, um, perspective on where this area is moving. Um, my real aims of today are initially just to go through a quick overview of 101 of the menstrual cycle, um, but then just to delve a little bit deeper into what we have seen from a research point of view in the field. Um, and like what, what the key issues are that female athletes face, I guess, with regard to menstruation and periods in particular. Um, and then I'm actually going to move on to like using my applied experience, how we've managed this and what we're really doing about this um, and how I feel the landscape is changing for women in sport in this space and, and how we can really support that moving forwards. So firstly, the menstrual cycle in the knees. So I guess in the last sort of six, seven years, um, the menstrual cycle has actually finally been discussed, which is pretty crazy. There's 3.9 million women out there. 100 million women are actually menstruating today, yet it took really until these kind of key icons in uh, women's sports and actually tennis being the first sport where this was initially discussed, um, for for this topic to really come to the fore and so um heather watson in 2015 petra kivotova in 2016 and then um this very brave and courageous chinese swimmer who um really kind of stood up and very much went against the kind of cultural norm to really highlight that um all of them felt that their menstrual cycle was a reason for them to not be able to perform to the best of their ability um and so while it really is positive that people are finally able to talk about this, I'm very mindful that the narrative here is, is actually really quite negative. And what does this actually mean for the next generation? What does this mean for girls and women in sport when they see that this thing is holding them back? And, you know, you'd hope that people are having a menstrual cycle every 28-ish days. And actually, does that mean you're limited every single 28 days for a day or a couple of days even? So I'm really determined to work on actually what can we do about this? How can we better support our female athletes, our exercising women, so that this isn't such a barrier? So anyway, 
101, what's the menstrual cycle? Now, um, I'm sure you all know this already, but I thought it would just be useful to have a bit of a, an overall recap. Um, so the first thing to say is that through this typical 28, really actually 25 to 35 day process, hormones are constantly changing. So you can see on this graph here that say day one, which is the onset of menstruation, which is when there is this effective bleed phase, um, hormone levels are actually really low. And then through the rest of the follicular phase, which is really like the first half of the menstrual cycle, um, there's this gradual increase in um, estrogen or estradiol, um, or estradiol is a type of estrogen. Um, and that increases to a point whereby then there's suddenly this increase in luteinizing hormone or LH, which then triggers ovulation. Um, if there's no fertilization, then post ovulation, and um, there's this formation of the corpus luteum. So um, effectively, the egg doesn't become fertilized and a corpus luteum structure is formed, which causes the secretion of progesterone. Um, so the second half of the menstrual cycle is really kind of known for being a high hormone phase. So there's this increase in progesterone. And alongside that, there's an increase in estrogen again. And that's like those two hormones stay relatively high right the way through into this like pre-menstrual window. So kind of five days out from the onset of menstruation and um, where the corpus luteum starts to effectively wither um, and pr uh, progesterone and estrogen levels decrease as a result. And that decrease in hormones then triggers the onset of menstruation. So these hormones actually, when they're high, um, it's like really important to maintain the endometrium lining. So you can see at the bottom, there's the kind of a, a schematic of the um, endometrial lining and effectively it thickens through the kind of to mid to late follicular phase and onto the end of the luteal phase. And then it sheds at the beginning of the follicular phase, which is of course menstruation. Um, and now in a eumenorrheic woman, so in a woman who has a like regular menstruation, so every 25 to 35 days, this hormonal like cyclical process um, is relatively consistent. There are some changes within each woman. Um, so there is a degree of intra variation. Um, however, normally in a like regularly cycling women, a regularly cyclical woman, you'd like to see a relatively consistent cycle length, cycle and cycle again. So there's this continual pattern of hormonal change. Um, now the key thing to remember here as well is that these hormones um, actually travel in the circulation. So they travel in the body, they travel in the blood. So they travel to the brain, to the fingers, to the toes, to the heart, to the lungs. And we actually know that there's receptors for these hormones spread throughout the body. So as the hormonal concentrations vary through the menstrual cycle, um, we actually know that there's kind of differing stimulation throughout the body um, and diff differing receptor expression and activation. Um, and then I really just wanted to highlight, so um, Hilary Critchley and her colleagues at the University of Edinburgh are doing some really, really interesting research to really understand this kind of endometrial breakdown and um, what that actually means. So it's such a refined process. Effectively, it's um, a scar-free wound healing process that happens literally, of course, every cycle in a eumenorrheic woman. Um, and actually, this process is obviously very tightly controlled and tightly refined find and um, there's actually a degree of hypoxia that occurs and then there's this repair process and the hypoxia actually triggers and helps facilitate that repair process. Um, and where this is slightly effectively dysfunctional, that's where you could see um, heavy menstrual bleeding or extreme symptoms or a whole range of other menstrual dysfunctions that we know are actually relatively common. And if anyone's interested, they should definitely go away and read some of this work because it really is fascinating and it's it's ever evolving. There's still so much to learn in this space. Um, so then I guess like really um, drilling down into our specific work and our specific area of interest. Um, so in 2019 now, um, seems quite recent given COVID, but actually it was a couple of years ago, um, we were given the opportunity to um, partner with Strava, so the exercising um, tracking app, um, to really understand or try to understand more about 
um, menstrual function in female athletes. So we actually um, surveyed over 18,000 women. And from that, we um, kind of pulled out a group of women who um, firstly completed the whole questionnaire, but also were of a reproductive age. Um, and uh, yeah, from that group of women across seven different territories, um, we got them to complete this 39 part questionnaire. Um, here you can see the different countries where um, we surveyed the women. So seven, seven different territories. So America, Brazil, um, the UK, the Republic of Ireland, France, Spain, and Germany. Um, and from that, we actually came up with some really interesting data. So historically, there really has been this perception that um, amenorrheic, so having a very erratic um, and very irregular cycle, so effectively going for three months, three to six months without having a bleed, um, if not more, um, and oligomenorrhea, which is where um, an individual has effectively a very, very irregular cycles. Um, there's been this real kind of belief that um, amenorrhea and oligomenorrhea are very common in the exercising population and actually most exercising women, particularly those who are doing longer distances, um, are likely to be amenorrheic and actually maybe that's normal and I know Tom's going to speak to you about that later. Um, but actually our data was really interesting, so we had some women putting in a lot of mileage and doing a lot of exercise, but actually we found that those who were eumenorrheic, so having a regular menstrual cycle from 25 to 35 days, like that was the most common category alongside those using hormonal contraception. And actually nearly half of the data that were using hormonal contraception and 42.1% of women were eumenorrheic. Um, on the flip side, only 10% were amenorrheic or oligomenorrheic. Um, and I think it was 1.1% were polymenorrheic, which means that they have very regular cycles. So more than 17 cycles reported um, over a 12 month period. Now, the other thing that was really interesting from this data was actually, while I think a lot of research focus has been based on amenorrhea and oligomenorrhea, which obviously, as again, Tom's going to explain in much more detail, like we know having a regular menstrual cycle is so important for a whole range of different factors and that um, kind of production of estrogen um, is essential for lots of like systemic functions um, but actually we found that there are other menstrual dysfunctions that are really common so heavy menstrual bleeding for example nearly 50 percent of our participants um, cited experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding at some point um, in their lives so far also ovarian cysts so over 10 percent of women are experiencing ovarian cysts which is a little bit more than those who um, are experiencing amenorrhea and oligomenorrhea and um, research focus actually hasn't been so much on these topics, particularly in the exercise, exercising population. And this is something which I think is really important to highlight to practitioners. Um, but also I think there needs to be increased awareness about diagnosis and um, actual management in the real world and in terms of exercise. So the next thing I just wanted to walk walk you through bearing in mind the high prevalence of um, heavy menstrual bleeding was actually some work that we have done previously um, in this space specifically. So actually as part of my PhD, um, I surveyed over um, 1800 women um, who were long distance marathon runners um, with a real aim of trying to understand more about the interrelationship between heavy menstrual bleeding and iron deficiency. Um, at the time, there hadn't been any work done in the heavy menstrual bleeding space in terms of the athletic population. Um, so I was generally, really and genuinely really fascinated to see that actually around 35.5% of women that we spoke to um, reported symptoms aligned to heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, now, as you can see here on the top left, the diagnosis for heavy menstrual bleeding is somewhat um, confusing and also inconclusive. Now, historically, there's been an arbitrary figure of losing eight milliliters of blood per cycle, 80 milliliters of blood per cycle. It's been the diagnosis for heavy menstrual bleeding, but 
I'm sure you know as well as I that for different size women, um, actually, like that really means something quite different. So, um, and also, how do you measure that? We know not all menstrual fluid is blood, and I think actually, it's a it's a really it's really challenging to have this arbitrary measure. Um, there have been more recent kind of um, pictographs to try and help people identify actually what this might mean, but the hygiene issues there, um, again, the differences in types of sanitary products, like it's, it's really, really challenging um, to identify and diagnose. Um, more recently, the NICE have come up with a like a more holistic approach to diagnosis and they talk much more about the impact on quality of life. Um, however, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, alongside actually um, a very prolific researcher in this space, Ian Fraser, um, have come up with more kind of slightly more objective um, measures of or kind of criterion for identifying heavy bleeding. And actually through my work, I specifically used Ian Fraser's diagnostic series um, alongside some of their ACOG2 and um, we yeah with that data we found that around a third of women um were actually citing having heavy menstrual bleeding and that was also associated with um self-reported uh, detriments to performance participation um and of course it was associated with an increased likelihood of being iron deficient and or anemic um Alongside that, actually, more recently, um, there's been some other studies that have also specifically captured data on iron deficiency, um, on heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and I thought it might just be interesting to highlight them as well. So Laura Forrest and her research group um, specifically focused on um, elite rugby players. And then Mike Armour and his group um, in Australia actually focused on um, elite, semi-elite or sub-elite and um, recreation. Australian athletes and um, their data was relatively comparable so the the rugby data was um, very very similar to our data so 33% cited um, a history of heavy menstrual bleeding and then um, a tiny bit under um, of the Australian athletes also cited a history of heavy menstrual bleeding um, and I think it's just really important to have appreciate that this really is quite a, a common issue and of course the implications associated with with this are quite vast so whether it's um, the increased likelihood of iron deficiency we know iron deficiency is more common in female athletes compared to non-female athletes and compared to male athletes already um, but also actually the psychological considerations and the physical considerations, whether it's a need to wear um, like period proof pants or leggings or um, actually be really proactive in that space and support the girls in that space. Um, but also thinking of the color of um, sports kit, like we know that there's lots of teams playing white or light clothing. And I think I mean, that really does need to change. Um, so I think that the potential implications and the anxiety associated with this also need to be appreciated. Um, and we also know that actually around 70% of heavy menstrual bleeding cases are idiopathic. So there's no underlying um, dysfunction. It's just a, a kind of natural component to their menstrual cycle. And it can change with time and with age. We know that youngsters are more prone to it. Postpartum individuals are more prone to it as well. So obviously I've spoken about heavy menstrual bleeding um, as being a, a key thing that women have to deal with um, with regard to their menstrual cycle. But another area that um, I think is really important is really trying to understand how the menstrual cycle can affect readiness and wellness um, on any one day. And we know that whether it's women performing on the sports pitch or whether they're performing um, in their everyday lives and uh, in their family lives as well. And there's lots of menstrual cycle specific symptoms that can cause them to feel that readiness is slightly altered. Um, now, the interesting thing is that there are around 150 different menstrual cycle symptoms, yet we still don't really fully understand the etiology of these symptoms. And there are a range of different hypotheses as to what is causing them. Um, and so much more work is needed in this space. But one potential mechanism is, is really um, focusing in on the inflammatory nature of the symptoms in this whole inflammatory process. After all, the menstrual cycle is the cyclical pattern of inflammation 
information. Um, so just to highlight what specifically happens in this sort of pre-menstrual during menstruation window. Um, so as I said on my 101, there's this uh, decline in progesterone pre-menstrually. Um, and this triggers an increase in release of uh, reactive oxygen species, which then drives this whole cascade response. But that also includes the release of NF kappa B. Um, and in response to increased amount or increased levels of NF kappa B, we then see an increased synthesis of a whole range of um, different markers, which then trigger this effective inflammatory cascade. So pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, um, cytokine, cytokines, um, matrix metalloproteins, um, and chemokines as well, which all um, are essential components and really essential factors which drive this inflammatory response which then trigger the breakdown of the endometrial lining um, but there's been some really interesting work um, primarily by Elizabeth Batone Johnson and Eleanor Gold two researchers based in the states really understanding how or the association between inflammation and specific menstrual cycle symptoms so I believe one way to target menstrual cycle symptoms and reduce them is actually to target this inflammatory cascade. And actually we've been doing that in some of our work um, to really positive effects. Um, obviously more, is, or more research is always needed in this space. So um, as part of our big collaborate, collaborative study that we conducted with Strava a couple of years ago um, was really aimed at focusing and trying to understand the most common symptoms that female athletes and exercising women were reporting. Um, and as you can see here, actually, um, mood changes and anxiety, cravings, appetite changes, um, breast pain and breast tenderness and tiredness and fatigue were the most common symptoms that were cited alongside things like menstrual cramps and lower back pain. And actually, um, over 90% of women were reporting certain ones or certain types of these symptoms. And Actually, that really demonstrates to me the importance of really trying to understand what's going on in the etiology behind these. Um, we know that historically there has been a kind of tendency to medicate in response to symptoms or menstrual dysfunctions. And obviously there are scenarios where that, that may well be very much necessary, but we really believe that say around two thirds of women actually use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication to manage these symptoms. And we believe that there are more natural ways of targeting this pathway um, to, to really support our female athletes and our exercising women. And that's something which we have shown in our everyday work. And I think obviously more research is, is always needed, but I, I really believe where symptoms are present, trying to um, naturally more holistically manage them as opposed to going down the kind of medication, hormonal contraception route as a kind of first stop shop is um, really, really important. And I think it's something we need to think about moving forwards. Um, so in terms of the menstrual cycle and performance, like the jury really is out in terms of whether it holds women back and whether it stops them from performing at their best. Um, and I, I think the, the challenge here is that the menstrual cycle is really individual. Every woman is different. And actually from cycle to cycle, women can even change. And I think the important thing to remember is that they might be able to perform on any one day, but then they need to, they might need to come back the next day and the day after, like say in, in a tournament environment or in a tennis environment. Um, so it really is individual. And I think as always, we need more research really looking at not just these steady state time points, but day in, day out throughout the whole menstrual cycle. Um, there has, however, been some interesting work done by, um, again, by Laura Forrest, Forrest and her colleagues, um, and also, again, by Mike Armour's group, really highlighting um, the individual perception of how they feel the menstrual, how individuals feel the menstrual cycle can actually really hold them back and um, prevent them from being able to train and, and report that their training is negatively affected. Now, in the interest of time, I won't delve into this too um, much further, but I would encourage anyone who's interested here to go away and have a look at some of these research papers. Now, with all this in mind, I think 
the key thing for me is what do we do about it? I don't think like, yes, it's great that people are talking about it, but I don't believe we should just start like stop there and kind of let people talk about it and not be proactive. And I think um, my real um, like take home today would be, I think where possible, we really should try and be proactive here. So using my applied hat and really applying this proactive approach, I think um, I just wanted to share a bit more about what what maybe I would suggest in this field and how I think um, moving forwards, we can be really proactive here. So first off, education. I think education is just so essential and we know that this area is woefully undereducated, not just in the UK, but globally. Um, whether it's through coaching courses or that one lesson that most kids have at school, it is just so seldom discussed and appreciated. So I think really starting with education is essential and there are increasing increasing resources um, or increasingly there are resources available, there's podcasts, there's infographics, etc. And I, I would really encourage people to get educated and that will facilitate more comfortable discussion as well. Alongside that, we actually know that the menstrual cycle is this really useful dial of readiness. If the menstrual cycle is regular, then we know that the body is in a, a pretty good state. And if symptoms aren't too bad, the body's in a pretty good state to uh, like demonstrating that it's adapting and dealing with training. If the body is on overload or um, not able to function properly, actually reproduction is a non-essential function. So it can be shut down and you might start seeing changes so elongations to menstrual cycles. Also, actually, we often see more symptoms um, depending on the individual if their body's in a bit of a, a stress state so it really is useful as a dial alongside that um, tracking and monitoring the menstrual cycle is also a really useful approach so um, I work obviously at Orico and we created the Fit Women app which is um, free to download and actually use globally um, and that enables women to track their cycles, learn more about what's going on in their body and really understand their individual pattern which I, I believe to be really essential. Um, there's lots of other apps out there and of course you can also use a calendar or pen and paper approach too. And then finally, here I've put the 24 hour athlete approach and I'm going to come to that on my next slide. But essentially, I think it it really is important to appreciate all of the different things that are going on in um, in a, a woman's life that contributes to this menstrual cycle and to having a regular menstrual cycle. It's not I think historically it's just been thought that it's all about nutrition but actually we know that having that sort of holistic approach to the all these different factors whether it's training load as I'm gonna highlight here um whether it's nutrition hydration training load um actually their kind of underlying underpinning fitness their recovery and their sleep their travel and their psychology all of these factors um contribute to having this regular menstrual cycle and this kind of ongoing pattern of hormonal fluctuations and so actually getting these right or not getting any of these right can lead to erratic and irregular menstrual cycles, changes in symptomology, changes in bleeding patterns. So really having that all encompassing approach is important. Um, and I believe that will equate to optimum performance. And that's something we see time and time again. Um, and I think the important thing here is that this is actually a bi-directional process. So we know that the hormonal changes can also impact your appetite, what you should be fueling with on any one day, how you might adapt and respond to training that may well be very individual, um, how much sleep you need or how your ability is to sleep, how you may ad uh, ad adjust your circadian rhythm in response to travel and, and very much so your psychology, your mood, your anxiety, your reaction time, your cognition, etc. And again, much more research is needed in this space, but data is very interesting to date. And I just wanted to highlight that this clearly is an interdisciplinary approach and whether you're working one on one with an individual, whether you are an individual female athlete, like it is important to just think of this whole um, kind of multidimensional approach to that underpinning underlying hormonal um, fluctuation.
And here's just an example of how this really works in, in the real world. And this is um, just some of the work that I've done with some of my clients, really, um, where we've dialed into their nutrition. We've really focused on monitoring their training load at different times in their cycle, whether we've really um, focused in on their movement and management of um, any symptoms, lower back pain, stiffness, soreness that they might experience at any time, prioritizing recovery and sleep at different times. And um, I guess really looking at the whole whole holistic picture here and again I think I and I really believe that to kind of aim for that optimum performance that is really important and then finally just to conclude I thought it would just be useful to share a few additional thoughts from my side so the first thing is I feel like initially I was highlighting this kind of negative narrative and yes okay people are talking about the menstrual cycle but actually it was more than a negative lens. And I believe times are changing and I, I feel really encouraged by some of these headlines where actually people are showing that by tracking their menstrual cycle, they are empowered and actually um, they can use this to understand more about themselves and um, actually, I guess, work with their hormones, not fight against them. And I think that really is important and I think it's exciting for the future. I think the way we educate people, the way we manage this space is, is really crucial. And I think um, using the menstrual cycle as a tool is, is actually very useful. Um, having this individual approach is essential. We know that there is both there are both inter and intra individual variation, but really um, first in, uh, appreciating the inter individual variation um, is key here. Education and discussion, I feel like they come hand in hand. How are you supposed to have a discussion if you don't really understand this process? And many people don't, it's not commonly taught as I already highlighted. So um, I think that as a good starting point is, is another thing to think about. And empowerment, I think, as I keep saying, empowering educa uh, athletes with the knowledge, educating them on their own bodies, their own cycle, um, I think is the gold ticket to really optimizing that female performance and helping them manage with their periods in their menstrual cycle um, th throughout their sporting career, but throughout their whole lives. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, I'm really looking forward to answering any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Georgie, for as always that very balanced discussion uh, on quite a complex and topical topic, if that, if I can say those two words together. So I've got some really um, great questions for you. Um, how does one get diagnosed for having heavy menstrual bleeding? Do you have to have it for the duration of the menstrual bleed to meet the diagnostic criteria? So how do you get diagnosed? Yeah, Amal, that is a actually very great question um, and one that I guess I spent a lot of time through my PhD really trying to get my head around. Um, I think the problem with heavy menstrual bleeding is it's so perceptual, like as I highlighted in my talk, it really is, um, I guess, like everyone is different in terms of the to their total blood volume and um, actually what is a kind of meaningful blood loss. So actually that whole diagnostic area is just so, um, I guess just like fluid in terms of our understanding and just very, com like not confused, but probably just uh, inconclusive. Um, and that's why the National Institute for Care Excellence came up with the more um, kind of holistic diagnostic series where they primarily focus in on actually how an individual feels and whether they feel that it is affecting them. Um, that being said, to very much to your point of the history of versus currently have it, um, again, like the, it's all very vague in this space. Um, from my perspective with a, actually, what does this mean? Um, I think there's kind of two considerations. So obviously we know heavy menstrual bleeding can increase risk of iron deficiency. So it inc increases those iron losses. Um, it also can be associated with increased inflammation. There's really interesting research, again, at Edinburgh University with Hilary Critchley and Jackie Mabin and their colleagues really trying to understand um, what is going on here um, and they're doing some like fascinating work around hypoxia inducible factor two and trying to understand what um, isn't quite working for actual 
heavy amounts of bleeding to occur. But again, how do you even diagnose that? So it's very confusing. But um, I think if we think about the implications of it, um, identifying it as is, as per the criteria, um, I think is useful because often, as I said, it increases likelihood or risk of iron deficiency, but also we know that it, there is an exaggerated inflammatory process that is going on when heavy menstrual bleeding occurs. So actually the likelihood of an individual having more symptoms is also greater. Um, so in my work, I guess I like to identify current signs of heavy menstrual bleeding, but also historical, because we also know if there's kind of a history of a large amount of blood loss, like we know that often getting blood tests is few and far between. So that can also identify whether actually do we need to consider iron status in this individual um, as a real priority. Um, so I, I don't really know if that answers your question, but then you could also say through the lifespan and like my research group, my um, our head of science at Orico, Charlie Pedler, is like really, really fascinated in focusing on iron status. And actually, we do know that through the life cycle, kind of risk of iron deficiency varies. So obviously, pre like postpartum, you're more likely to be in that iron deficient state due to high amounts or significant amounts of blood loss, which are likely to uh, occur through um, actually like childbirth. Um, but also, I think, and we see it like youngsters are more likely to have heavy bleeding, and then that might change through the life cycle. So I just think um, the whole area is very much in need of better discussion, better understanding, better diag diagnos or diagnoses. But um, I think, yeah, definitely capturing both current okay. and past. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this next question I think you're going to like. Um, with plant-based diets becoming more popular, has this shown to be beneficial, particularly as it's thought to be less inflammatory? So I guess particularly at that premenstrual phase. Yeah, good question. So obviously we know that plant-based diets are, as you say, lower in terms of inflammation, but also higher in fiber um, and likely to maybe support gut health a little bit more. So we know that um, hormones get metabolized in the liver, but then pass through the gut. So if the gut is in a really good healthy state then actually that kind of premenstrual roller coaster is a bit smoother um so yes and there is actually some interesting work not specifically focusing on plant-based diets but focusing more on like good quality diets um and showing lower symptoms associated with that um i also think and this will very much link it to tom's talk as well um I think we need to be mindful as well that like the kind of higher fiber foods may well result in like a lower consumption and less kind of calorie dense options. So then that can increase risk of the sort of oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea bracket. And actually, we've got some really interesting research really focusing in on this and um, specific like diet choices and risk of dysfunctional cycles, whether they're um, dysmenorrheic, so very symptomatic versus um, amenorrheic, oligomenorrheic. Um, and just to give you a quick teaser on that, definitely a balanced diet is the way forward, in my opinion, from the research we've done so far and what I've read. Amazing, thank you. Okay, so I note that we have had some great questions come through right at the end, and um, a lot of them relate to hormonal contraception. And I think what I might do just to keep to time is we're gonna head across to the next talk but um, it is possible for us to answer some of your questions in the chat. So as some of them are along a similar theme, uh, I might deploy Georgie on that task um, through, through Tom's talk. And I am gonna move us on now um, and introduce Dr. Thomas O'Leary. Thank you, Georgie, very much. So Tom is a postdoctoral researcher and advisor at the Ministry of Defense, where he currently leads on several trials focusing on the health and performance risks uh, in women joining infantry roles. He has significant experience in investigating skeletal adaptations and bone and calcium metabolism in the context of low energy availability and how this applies to military training and employment. Tom has a wealth of knowledge in these areas and I always learn so much from his talks. So it's my pleasure to introduce him to you tonight. Thank you, Tom. Hi, welcome to this uh, talk on relative energy deficiency in sport and bone health in female athletes. 
Um, my name is Tom O'Leary and I'm a, a research physiologist in the British Army, but I'm an also an honorary senior research fellow at UCL. First, I'd like to thank the organisers of this event for inviting me to talk. So if I give you an overview of the presentation, firstly, I'll do some housekeeping and cover some of the main theories in energy deficiency, notably the female athlete triad and relative energy deficiency syndromes. And then I'm going to put a bit of a, a military spin on it. And I'll talk about some of the things we see in the military and talk about some of the energy demands. And then I'll talk about some of the bone health issues we see. And then I'll put that all together with applications in, in female soldiers and female athletes. So how energy deficiency and bone combine in these populations. So firstly, uh, a classic syndrome known as a female athlete triad, um, fairly well uh, published and defined and revolves around three key um, outcomes. One is energy availability, the second is bone health, and the third one is menstrual function. And these three components form a, what's called a triad um, with energy deficiency or, or low energy availability at the heart of that. And in Native in 2007, in MSSE, they published this uh, update of the triad that shows that these conditions exist on a, on a spectrum. So an athlete can be somewhere on this spectrum, ranging from optimal energy availability, eumenorrheic, normal menstrual function, and optimal bone health, deteriorating down to osteoporosis, a full-blown eating disorder, and amenor amenorrhea. This concept was updated uh, more recently in what's known as a relative energy deficiency in sport model which expanded some of these low energy availability outcomes to include a, a wider range of performance outcomes and health outcomes. So, so health outcomes on the left, noting that the triads highlighted there and some performance outcomes on the right. And this review paper highlighted that there might be some more uh, health and performance uh, outcomes associated with, with not eating enough, with having low energy availability. And these are, these are, summarized, these are summarized here. So why is this important for bone? Why is energy availability important for bone? Well, firstly, bone is an incredibly metabolically active tissue. So it's an endocrine organ, and a lot of the endocrine systems act on the bone, and bone can act on some of these systems. So I'm going to highlight a couple here, um, two, main, two main ways in which energy can affect bone, and we tend to think of these as direct and indirect. So through direct effects, as you see in the middle, IGF-1 acts directly on bone, and if we don't consume enough energy, we see a drop in IGF-1, and IGF-1 is a very bone anabolic hormone. So if we have acute decreases in our energy intake or energy availability, we see a decrease in these bone anabolic hormones, IGF-1. And the indirect effects are through reproductive function. And so if we think back to the triad, low energy availability can result in a disruption or, or suppression of menses. And that's a signal that some low sex steroid hormones. So um, menstrual function is suppressed, typically a sign of low estradiol, and estradiol is really important on bone. Typically, we can think of these as, as bone formation and bone resorption processes. So IGF-1 has a real active role on bone formation, helps us build and form new bone. And then estradiol has a, has a real regulating role in bone resorption. So it's really important for maintaining bone resorption. So when we have low IGF-1, we have suppressed bone formation. When we have low estradiol, we have high bone resorption. So it's going to really affect the bone density, geometry, and architecture. A couple of classic studies. Um, this is from Arlen Lauts in, in JBMR. And they looked at the kind of dose response of um, low energy availability and um, bone. So they, they suppressed energy availability to the energy available for bodily function from 45 down to 10. And what they showed that as you suppress energy availability, some of the bone formation markers on the left there, so we set a P1 CP, PICP, some of the bone formation markers are suppressed. And then NTX, the bone resorption marker, is increased, but only at more severe energy availability, uh, lower energy availabilities. So what, what these pivotal data show us is that as we suppress energy intake, as we lower our energy availability, bone form formation is suppressed, and then we get to more severe markers, bone resorption is increased. Another classic study looking at um, bones, this is bone mineral content, so the structural components of bone by Barbara Drinkwater, just showed that when we take groups of athletes by their menstrual status, so we use that as a surrogate marker of energy status, we see that amenorrheic athletes in the red have a lower bone mineral content than eumenorrheic counterparts. So again, low energy availability, menstrual disturbance, and we see a lower bone mineral content. So it appears these metabolic perturbations appear in structural components of bone, so in bone mineral content in this example. A important consideration, what does this mean for kind of injury and fracture risk? So this is a, this is a really nice paper from Kate Ackerman in um, MSSE in 2015, and compared stress fracture risks in groups of athletes based on their menstrual status. So amenorrheic athletes on the left, 
you may agree athletes in the middle and non-athletes on the right. And what this shows is when athletes do not have normal menstrual function, so they're amenorrheic, and we assume that to be related to energy availability in this case, or low energy or insufficient energy, they have a higher prevalence of stress fracture compared to their eumenorrheic counterparts. So being a amenorrheic in an athlete appears to come with a greater risk of stress fracture. Now, one question about those studies is, um, what's energy having a role versus estrogen? Because um, new data starting to suggest they might have different effects. And I won't talk too much into this, but I'll just highlight this slide to your, the study to your, your attention, that energy and estrogen appear to have different effects. And this is a nice study by Emily Southmade using PQCT, so peripheral quantitative computed tomography to look at the structure of the radius in the tibia. And on the left, we see the effects that energy had and on the right, the estrogen deficiency had. And it's a real nice study comparing women by menstrual function, assuming that's estrogen deficient versus non, and those who are energy replete versus eating enough energy. They start to, to tease open. I won't talk through them now, but just to highlight that energy and estrogen deficiency do appear to have slightly different roles on the skeleton. And then finally, uh, a recent paper by um, Kate Ackerman, again, in um, J.B. Meyer Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, showing what happens when we put estradiol as a treatment for those amenorrheic athletes. So the three groups there, patch, estradiol patch in black, contraceptive pill, the combined or contraceptive pill in gray, and then none in, in, uh, in the empty bars. And they showed compared with none, there were some differences between, compared with the, the pill treatment, sorry, there were some differences with the estradiol patch. So estradiol patch appearing to contribute to a, positive change in bone to so the top one showing a volumetric BMD uh, across the, the tibia and the bottom figures across the across the radius. So showing that at the tibia and the radius, there might be some, some benefits of estradiol treatment in these groups. That's a quick summary of, of, of the energy and bone effects. I'm going to really mention why this is kind of of interest to the people in the military and researchers in, in the military. So this is a study, we, uh, a review paper we published recently looking at what can we learn from the, the military about energy deficiency and, and female health and performance. And so this, this review looked at and summed all the papers that have looked at some of the effect of training on outcomes. And we showed with that figure on the left there, these are some of the outcomes you see with periods of military training and energy deficit. We see suppressed menstrual function, we see impaired bone health and some of the other characteristics that are, are highlighted in the relative energy deficiency in sport model. Why this is important for bone? Because we see some changes in some of the endocrine markers that we know are uh, important for bones. We see an increase in cortisol, a decrease in sex steroid hormones, and a decrease in insulin growth factor one. So we see some metabolic markers that suggest there's energy deficiency in military training, and these might be important for, for bone health. So we can use the military as a nice model to understand that direct relationship a bit more. So firstly, to define what we mean going forward, low energy availability. Um, and why it's important for military. So suboptimal we consider as uh, 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass. And that's calculated by looking at the energy intake of someone minus the energy expenditure. And we can think of that as energy available for normal bodily function beyond exercise. And then we consider low below 30. So those are traditionally defined concepts, but I'll, I'll use them carefully because um, we need to calculate those measures. We need to have a good measure of, of purposeful exercise. So energy intake minus purposeful exercise. It's quite a hard thing to define in the military. But why it's important for the military is because we have lots of conditions which can cause low energy availability. So high exercise energy expenditure, energy, uh, restricted food intake, and that happens for a number of reasons um, due to suppressed appetite or logistical challenging uh, challenges with trying to eat enough food in the field. Some disordered eating, but not quite perhaps as relevant for the military as, uh, as um, athletes. We see it as a training objective. So in the military, we like to expose people to energy restriction because it's part of um, preparing them for their job. And there are body mass standards which can result in, in the need to have low energy availability. So to summarize that slide, um, being in the military does expose people to low energy availability. And these are some of the causes. If we have a quick look at the demands of army training. So um, this is a paper we published looking at how the demands are different between men and women. And I'll focus on that, that figure at the bottom right there, which is energy expenditure in men and women. So as you can see, men and women in soldier, normal soldier, basic training, expend between three and 4,000 calories a day. And that's every day for, for several months, or so high energy um, expenditure. And the graph on the left shows the kind of mileage they're doing, the kind of distance. So typically about 13 or 14 kilometers every day for three or four period so the energy expenditure demands are high so why is this important for us in the military well we need to understand the link between energy and bone because we see a high prevalence of stress fractures 
we see typically anywhere published between one and 20% of people getting a stress fracture mid to training depend on, depending on the type of course, the type of activity they're doing. Typically it's two to three times higher in women than men. And that goes to the same for athletes. So, so in women, we typically see in female soldiers and female athletes are two to three times higher risk in um, training than, than men. That might be different by sight. So we tend to see a slightly greater risk in women. So it can be up to 10 times higher in, in women for a hip a stress fracture. And why this is, um, while, I, while we use the military training to kind of understand this, or what's useful to understand this concept is that we have groups of men and women going through the same type of training. So we can start to understand the link between training, uh, energy and stress fractures and bone. This is a paper uh, we published recently in 2020, just looking at the types of training and sex on um, on bone in the, in the military with stress fractures and outcome. If I talk through this data quickly, it shows that when you're in the infantry, infantry is a type of, um, a, a harder type of training characterized by carrying heavier weight, so lots more weight on the back, carrying greater distances. We see a basically a threefold increased risk of stress fracture in the infantry compared to a standard entry soldier training. And this is in men, so we know the type of training you do really does influence your stress fracture risk. And then if we look at um, women versus men, and so in, on the left figure in standard entry, this is men and women undergoing normal soldier training. We interestingly don't see any difference in stress fracture risks. But in our officer training, which is more similar to the uh, infantry type training, we see a almost sevenfold increased risk in women undergoing uh, uh, this type of training compared with men. So women und undergoing officer training about a sevenfold risk of a stress fracture compared to men. And that's training which is longer and harder and carrying more weight. So these, these men and women are exposed to greater training stress in the field, greater energy restriction, more load carriage carrying heavy weight. So as the training goes up, the intensity goes up, the duration goes up, that difference between men and women ap appears to be even greater. And this is interesting because we actually see a me mechanical loading paradox in military training because we know mechanical loading is good for bone. It, it's, it's training is good to develop bone strength. Uh, and this paper, we published some of our thoughts on, on that paradox where the, the stresses and strains that cause stress fractures are the same stresses and strains which cause an anabolic, an anabolic response to, or a protective response to training. So this mechanical loading paradox where loading causes bone to both be develop strength and, and adapt, but also fracture if it's, a, it's overdone. And I'll give you an example of some of those data where we've looked at bone in military training in uh, infantry uh, training in men. So that, that first slide where I showed a threefold increased risk of stress fracture, we see adaptation of the, of the bone. So top right image shows a slice of bone taking at the tibia, and this is using high resolution peripheral quantitative computer tomography. So we get these nice high resolution images of, of the, the tibial bone. And the figure on the left shows what happens to trabecular density in geometry. So after 13 weeks of British Army infantry training, we see a more dense trabecular bone. So the distal tibia gets more dense, the trabecular volumetric uh, bone mineral density increases. And that's not due to the change in the tra trabecular microarchia on the right, but I'll, I'll discuss what that might be. Now, if we have the cortical bone, we see similar. We see an increase in the cortical area of bone and cortical thickness. So in that top right figure, the boundary, that nice thick boundary on the bone is the, the cortical bone. And we see that wall getting thicker and the area getting bigger. So the bone's adapting to training, but it's also um, coming at a, a risk of a high risk of fracture. So we've repeated this type of work looking at what happens to some of those women in the officer training, whether it's sevenfold risk of stress fracture compared with men, what happens to the, the skeleton when we train under those conditions. And this work's recently published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, where we looked at some tibial adaptations in, in women undergoing the 44-week officer commissioning course. And that's an image on the left of, of that course at the Royal Military Academy Centre. And so what we did is we followed women for 44 weeks. We followed 51 of them. And we got high resolution PQCT images at week one, 14, 28, and 44. And each one of those images signifies the end of a training term. So a 14 week block of training, or a roughly three month block of training. And we also took dextra images and took some blood samples to look at the energy of the uh, states of these women and then what's happening to the skeleton under that type of training. Um, these are the energy data. So you can kind of see the energy restriction they're under. So over the course of about a year, we see them in eating by about 5,000 calories per day. So that's eating 5,000 calories less than they're burning a day and men about 1,000 calories a day over the course of, of bespoke periods of that training in term one, term two, term three. And that's determined using gold standard methods. So we've used the weighed food method there in the canteen and W labor water to measure energy expenditure. And so what happens to the skeleton? We see these really osteogenic 
changes which are uh, supportive of, of a good adaptation to exercise. So this is, a again, a distal image of the tibia so that you can see an example image in the top right of the, the graph to look at how bone density changes in the trabecular and cortical partments of that bone. So we see no change in the cortical density in the, in the third graph from the top, but we see this nice steady increase in total and trabecular density. So as training goes on throughout that year, the trabecular density, so that nice meshy green part in the top right image is really increasing. It's really improving some of the denser trabeculi. In the middle set of figures, that's bone geometry, so the shape of the bone. And we see some real interesting changes in the shape of the bone. So the bone doesn't just change its density, it changes its shape too. So we see an increase in trabecular volume, so the volume of the trabecular going up. And we also see an increase in the cortical area and cortical thickness. So again, if you refer back to that top right image, that thin white border around the trabecular is the cortical bone, and that cortical bone is getting thicker and ca causing greater area. And then if we look at the bottom figures, that's the microarchitecture. So we're looking at the microstructure. So we're looking at trabecular number, at the, at the first figure in C, and we're seeing as training goes on, trabecular number increase and the trabecular thickness increase. So those green trabecular, that nice spongy support part of the bone is increasing in both number and size of trabecular. If we look at the cortical bone, so again, an image on the top right to show you the type of area of the bone. This is the distal third of the tibia where most fractures happen. We see um, a interesting drop in density. So at week 14 in the top right figure, you can see that small drop in cortical density. So within 14 weeks, the cortical shell of the bone has become less dense and then recovers later on in training. And what that might be because is that bone's uh, resorbing, the damaged bone is being removed and then reforming. And interestingly, around a week 14 is when our peak of our stress fractures happen in this course. So what we suspect is happening is that cortical bone being remodeled during exercise, the damaged bone is being removed, and before that new bone was being formed, we're having this period of high susceptibility to stress fracture, which is when we see, we see stress fractures. I'll also note in that middle figure, the bone geometry changes, so the area gets wider. So as the bone gets wider, there's more space to fill with mineral. So we see a decrease in, in mineralization of the bone early in training, which then mineralizes later, typical with a, a bone remodeling pattern. And if we have a look at some of the DEXA data, we see a drop in ribs aero density, but nothing over the, the whole body. Um, so potentially some redistribution of, of calcium with a drop in ribs, um, bone mineral density, but, but nothing major to report, something I might touch on later. So an important part of this trial is to look at the reproductive function of these women. So as, as I mentioned, part of the trial is looking at energy function, but, um, energy, bone and reproductive function. So we also um, took weekly urine samples from these participants to look at um, uh, menstrual function, and we took blood samples at set points throughout the term. What we looked at in those um, blood samples, we looked at a stimulated response to gonadarelin. So we infused gonadarelin to um, look at the LH and FSH response. So the gonadotrophin response to a gonadarelin dose to see how well the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis res is responding to those. So at baseline, we see a nice healthy response. We infuse gonadarelin and over the next hour, we see an LH and FSH response. And at the back end of training, we see that response suppressed. So it tells us this down regulation of the central hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So we're seeing a suppression of the central regulation of, of um, menstrual function. And that incurs alongside some, an increased number of an, uh, an anovulatory cycles and suppression of menstruation. So we see the number of anovulatory cycles increasing. So there is evidence of suppressed reproductive function, and it may or may not be due to suppressed energy, but we, we know the, these um, women are uh, exposed to periods of uh, insufficient energy intake. However, military training is still osteogenic, so we still see these nice adaptations in bone um, characteristic of a, of a nice training response. That study shows us that osteogenic adaptations to exercise are possible with energy restriction um, or, or, or low energy availability, even when there's evidence of reproductive function. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on to another study where we've looked at um, a, more for, a more severe form of energy restriction. So this is a trial looking at something called Expedition Ice Maiden, which is a, a British Army expedition to cross the Antarctic. And this trial looked at what are the acute severe energy restriction effects on the skeleton um, to a real severe model of energy restriction. So this is an overview of what that trial looked like. So it's covering 1,700 kilometers across the Antarctic by the South Pole in 61 days, pulling all done by muscle power. So all pulled, uh, all done by pulling everything required in, in polks, 80 kilo polks. And it was six women from the British Army who were, who were selected from, a, from a, uh, a much higher initial starting team of 250. 
Uh, the, the bone data are published in this top paper. For those interested in the reproductive in the bottom, but I'll talk through those bone data to you now. So we used um, DEXA, dual energy X-ray absorbometry to look at body composition changes. And we saw a, a nine and a half kilo loss in 61 days, so 13% of body mass. Kind of military expedition gives us a real look at what happens to the skeleton with real severe energy restriction over, over short periods of time. So we saw lots of lean, uh, lots of body mass loss, but no change in lean mass. So most of that body mass change coming from, from body fat. What did we see in the skeleton? We saw some marked changes in um, BMD of the aerial, aerial BMD of the, act, um, the uh, actual skeleton, appendicular skeleton. Sorry, actual skeleton. So we saw a roughly 3% decline in trunk, 5% decline in ribs, and 3.5% decline in spine, um, A, B, and D. So and some real marked changes in the, the bone from the axial skeleton in the, in the center of the body, uh, but with no real change in the in the periphery, so the legs or the arms. So we're seeing with that type of energy restriction, that type of body mass, a real rapid loss in BMD of the spine, ribs, and in the in the trunk area. If we look at some of the biochemistry data, we see um, some of the responses you'd expect. So we see a drop in bone formation and an increase in bone resorption. So we call that bone turnover and cupping. Less bones being formed and more bones being resorbed. But we saw no change in the tibial bone macro microstructure. So the tibial bone remained fairly intact and, and had um, unchanged response to this type of exercise. So when you when you undergo that type of rapid decrease in body mass, uh, insufficient energy intake, we see a rapid loss of bone from the from the ribs and spine, but no change in the in the tibia. So this begs the question: What can we do about that type of bone response to energy restriction? So this trial we looked at trying to refeed. Um, low energy availability in the field. So this trial looked at um, 30 infantry soldiers undergoing an eight-week combat course. So the energy expenditure was 5,000 calories a day, and we assigned 15 to get the normal control diet and 15 to get the uh, 1,200 uh, calories of supplementation. We'd run a previous trial looking at energy, um, energy and body mass uh, changes with this type of training. Uh, and so typically there's an under eating of 1200 calories a day. So we, we tried to feed that back in and took blood at baseline week six and week eight. So with, with training and feeding is when we supplement back in some of that energy deficit, it preserves or increases markers of bone formation. So some of that characteristic drop in bone formation with under eating or energy restriction, we can protect with some supplementation, but we saw no change in bone resorption. So what that kind of tells us, referring back to that first uh, direct mechanism of energy restriction, that energy restriction uh, can uh, suppress bone formation, and if we feed, we can stop some of that. But there was no effect on some of the bone resorption responses. So bone formation may be more sensitive to feeding than, than bone resorption acute, acutely anyway. So these are some of the um, bone active endocrine markers. So on the left, some of the sex steroid hormones, including the gonadotrophins, LH, FSH, estradiol, and testosterone. And as expected, we saw a, a drop in testosterone and estradiol and free testosterone. So the energy restriction and the training stress was crashing some of the sex steroids that are really important for bone regulation, but feeding did not protect them. So perhaps one mechanism by which we didn't see bone resorption protective. And then the thyroid hormones on the, on the right there. So no change in some of the sex steroid hormones and no change in some of the thyroid hormones. There were some changes in some of the IGF-1 markers, which I haven't shown here. So it's perhaps through the, the IGF-1 direct mechanism on bone and hence why we saw sort of bone formation response. So in conclusion, bone is a very metabolically active tissue. And when we suppress or under eat, we have low energy availability, bone formation is suppressed and bone resorption is increased. And this uncoupling of bone turner can lead to a, a loss of bone mass. And we've shown that in some of those isolated data when that's acutely done for, for acute periods of time. Some emerging data show that low estradiol and low energy may have independent and site specific effects on bone. Not something I've covered uh, in any great length here, but certainly an area of future work to look at how low estradiol and uh, low energy can have perhaps different site specific effects. What we see in military training is that bone continues to adapt in women across one year of military training despite those uh, mental disturbances and low energy availability. So evidence of low energy availability both through dietary assessments and menstrual function assessments, but that bone still continues to adapt. So osteogenic changes to bone are still possible. However, I will note in those data, um, we, we limitations with this type of trial is that we have a survivor cohort. So those who do fracture are typically not followed up. So it's a, it is a survivor cohort. 
acutely, energy deficiency suppresses bone formation, but when we supplement, we can we can prevent some of that suppression of bone formation, which is a potential um, mechanism for looking at how we can protect bone in, a, in an acutely active uh, high-risk population like the military. I thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic as always. Um, and I do have some questions for you. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, this one. Does skeletal adaptation in the context of low energy availability get affected by hot temperatures? Um, and in brackets, since hot temperatures will cause energy to be drained. What are your thoughts there? Um, that's a good question. I don't have any direct data to refer to to answer that one, but I could perhaps postulate a couple of reasons why it might. So um, heat's a important component of the military, so it's something we should be looking at. But um, I guess if, if heat affects your energy availability, in theory, it would affect bone. Um, I guess there's two mechanisms by which I think that might be able to happen. So um, one thing we're interested in is about the kind of role of appetite and appetite regulation in energy availability. So if you're if you're kind of training very hard and you're you're operating in a field environment as a soldier, you're less likely to eat because you're busy, you're combined, it's quite stressful. I guess heat could interact with that mechanism. And so if heat independently suppresses appetite, then um, there's a good reason as to why it could affect energy availability and therefore bone. Uh, another potential avenue, and, and there's lots of data and lots of interest at the moment, are looking at um, how exercise acutely disturbs calcium metabolism. And one theory is that when we exercise, we see a small drop in circulating calcium, which is compensated by an increase in bone resorption. And so the bone will offload some calcium into circulation to protect that circulating calcium. And one theory which is being looked at, and, and there's kind of some mixed data, is that sweating contributes to some of that drop in circulating serum calcium. So the more you sweat, the greater calcium you'll lose through dermal sources through your skin. And so there are a couple of trials looking at hot and cool conditions with calcium loss during sweat, and that may drive uh, a bone resorption response. Um, it'd have to be a significant effect on energy expenditure to um, have any direct effect on energy availability, but it might have an effect through yeah, suppressing appetite and or changing the amount of calcium you lose through your, through your sweat. But I don't have a huge amount of data to draw on, but certainly an interesting one for us. Oh yeah, that's actually really Fascinating. Um, so great question. Um, a, a question for the clinicians, really. So for those of us working with uh, with athletes who are at risk of low energy availability and bone stress injuries, do you have any reliable surrogate or indirect markers that you would recommend um, for use of monitoring risk of suboptimal bony adaptation? Um, for example, as you presented in these female soldiers, it is menstrual function via measurement of the, say, the HPA axis in serological markers, hormonal profiles, uh, or monitoring ovulation good enough um, as a surrogate marker for, say, the, the findings you, you saw on P PQCT? There's lots of things you could do. So I'll refer back to the kind of direct indirect pathways I referred to. So there's lots of um, markers that can tell you or hint at whether someone's exposed to low energy availability and they don't even need to be biochemical so there's lots of work looking at kind of eating behaviors if it's a if it's a population at risk of low energy availability through a mechanism of having an eating disorder or disordered eating, so food avoidance or, or trying to maintain low body weight so there are some data showing eating behaviors can correlate with stress fracture and bone risk so it doesn't even have to be biochemical if you're kind of worried about some of those more subtle effects there's lots of sensitive energy markers which could be used so t3 is a good one so to look at thyroid hormones they're very energy sensitive and so that that would be a, a possible way um, menstrual cycle is obviously a great one so if someone's amenorrheic or, or oligomenorrheic that's an obvious flag however you might perhaps be more interested in some subtle markers that don't lead to amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea so some of the endocrine markers but certainly if someone's amenorrheic or oligomenorrheic we'd all, almost always consider them at risk higher risk of a stress fracture if we, if we look back to some of that data i presented another potential panel I'd, I'd recommend is the female athlete triad and the red s committees both have kind of recommended screening tools relating from some of those eating behaviors through to some blood panels and through to dexa and there's kind of um lots of red green amber hints in there which i'd refer you to, to have a look at
Yeah, they're very user friendly, so I would recommend those as well. Um, have you got any data on the effect of supplementing estradiol, especially via transdermal patches in hypothalamic amenorrhea um, on, on bones? So, so is, is transdermal estrogen in the context of low energy availability in amenorrhea protective of bone? I would refer you back to that um, Kate Aquin paper. So um, it's in it's in uh, Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. It's probably the best evidence there is at the minute. And that was a randomised, and that was quite a big randomised control trial, looking at um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and the transdermal estrogen patch. And in that group, they also had the combined a, a combined pill group. I think that's probably the best data we have. We don't have any data on that per se. The only data we have, and it's data we've um, we've written up and we'll, we'll publish shortly is the effect of hormonal contraceptive use on skeletal adaptations. So we've looked at, um, and we'll publish this very shortly, is the um, the bone adaptation in a cross-sectional view of, of women on based on their contraceptive use. So how how does a skeleton adapt by a function of contraceptive use in basic training? That's probably the closest data we have. Um, so last one from the Ice Maiden data. Do you think the extreme cold temperature um, alters substrate utilization and therefore increases the impact of lower energy availability? It's a, it's a really, really good question. I think the interesting data, for, uh, the interesting part of the Ice Maiden data was they lost um, effectively all of their body mass through fat mass. And so what we're seeing in the military is some of the sex differences in metabolism. And actually men tend to lose lean mass under those kind of energy restriction limitations and women do not. So there's a nice sex difference there, which I'd, I'd like to plug in and we're certainly going to look at. As to whether the cold had an effect, I really couldn't tell you, but it's a really great, really great question. The cold is actually an interesting stressor again, because we're interested in lots of things that suppress appetite, because uh, that sometimes the inter interventions in the military might be, let's feed people, put energy back in, but actually appetite suppression when you're under hard training and environmental and or psychological stress is actually very difficult to deal with. But I don't have any metabolic data, but it's a, it's a really important point. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Mel. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, on to our final talk this evening, uh, delivered by our co-host tonight, Dr. Amal Hassan. Uh, I'm fortunate to be a colleague with her here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. Uh, and Amal is a, is a consultant in sport and exercise medicine with a special passion for female health, women's health, and dance medicine and dance science. Uh, she is a uh, sport and exercise medicine physician at the Lower Royal Ballet School, uh, and also is a team physician at Harlequins Women's uh, Rugby Football Club. Um, tonight, the final talk is going to be on pregnancy, exercise, and the athlete. Thank you to the team for having me. I'm going to talk to you about pregnancy, exercise, and the athlete. After a brief introduction, I'm going to touch on pregnancy adaptation before moving on to present the unique considerations that affect our pregnant athlete. Then move on to discussing MDT management from preconception up until postpartum, rounding off with some key points to take away. And although I mention uh, postpartum care, unfortunately delving into the depths of this is beyond the scope of today's talk, but of course uh, will feature during the management uh, section of the discussion in pregnancy in the form of planning. I have no financial disclosures. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring to the term elite athlete a lot, but to a degree, the same principles will apply to those training regularly with a goal in mind, uh, or those to competing at an amateur, those who are competing at an amateur level. I want to alert you to my prospective use of the word stillbirth, Mis miscarriage, neonatal death, preterm birth and perineal tears. And I also want to make clear that although at times I will refer to the terms woman or women, I appreciate that not all of us identify with our assigned gender at birth. Thank you. So whilst pregnancy related morbidity rises and physical activity participation amongst pregnant individuals in the general population continues to decrease, complicated, of course, by, as everything has been by the COVID pandemic, over the last decade, especially mainstream media has brought to our attention a host of athletes who buck this trend by continuing to participate in elite sport before, during and after pregnancy. 
Unsurprisingly, alongside the often pervasive so socio-cultural narrative that pregnant women should rest rather than exert themselves, controversy continues to accompany the journey of the pregnancies of athletes, as well as scrutiny concerning their postnatal performance. There remains, however, a decline uh, in sport and exercise participation in pregnancy pregnant athletes because of, in part, a lack of research and guidelines for these women. Exercise during and following pregnancy is established to be safe and beneficial for the majority of individuals with a number of potential benefits that more often than not, even in the context of contraindication where modifications exist, will outweigh the potential risks. In the absence of medical or obstetric contraindication, all pregnant women are encouraged to be physically active to the levels uh, displayed on your screen currently. However, as I have already mentioned, high quality evidence-based guidelines for the pregnant elite athlete is lacking. Due to this paucity in uh, specific evidence-based guidelines, a working group set out by the International Olympic Committee collaborated in 2016 with the aim of reviewing the existing medical literature resulting in the publication of five papers summarizing the relevant evidence available at the time. However, very few of the studies existing at that time included elite pregnant athletes, reflecting limited knowledge on the effect of participation in elite sport on the pregnant athlete, the fetus, and practical issues related to combining the role of being a mother and an elite athlete. This is problematic given the immense physiological and biomechanical adaptations the pregnant body undergoes in the context of the demands associated with an athletic career or athletic endeavors. And there is concern, and in fact, some studies have gone as far as suggesting that elite pregnant athletes may encounter more potential perinatal risks, including risk of miscarriage, preterm birth prolonged labor, low fetal birth weight, pelvic floor dysfunction and diastasis of the rectus abdominis, low back and pelvic girdle pain, and transient osteoporosis. Before we go on to explore these risks in a little more detail, and although it is beyond the scope of time I have with you today, I do want to convey how important it is that clinicians develop a sound understanding of the adaptations that occur during each trimester of pregnancy, as well as after childbirth, and how these changes may impact on physical activity uh, through exercise physiology. They are very nicely summarized in a paper I recently collaborated on, authored by Thea Jackson and Emma Bostock, led by the wonderful Kirsty Elliott Sale. And in a nutshell, these are unique physiological musculoskeletal and psychological adaptations that have potential implications for pregnancy and postpartum health, function, and physical activity. So in terms of risks, let's start with a recent paper that presents data on exercise patterns, pregnancy outcomes and morbidity uh, in a group of high-performing athletes. The authors reported that there were no differences when comparing athletes against active controls in relation to fertility problems, miscarriage, preterm birth, and low birth weight. Um, the researchers also suggest that neither the athletes included in the study nor the active controls were satisfied with the training and exercise advice given to them, which may actually present practical challenges when you're preparing for return to sport, particularly in the athletic group. Other findings included that the athletes were more likely to return within six weeks um, postpartum, return to sport, sorry, that the athletes were more likely to report musculoskeletal complaints and constipation in the third trimester, that they were more likely to suffer severe injury, such as bone stress injury during the postpartum period, uh, most likely due to that relative accelerated return to activity postpartum. Uh, and interestingly, that the eating disorder rate was likely to reduce by the postpartum point in athletes uh, as compared to controls. Although the athletes in this study demonstrated a similar training pattern to active controls, 
a reduction of exercise volume through pregnancy to postpartum. The athletes demonstrated much higher training volumes than controls in both endurance and strength-based activity, which is to be expected. The reasons for the decline in exercise volume in both groups is likely related to the rapidly developing physiological adaptation that continues um, to contribute to nausea and fatigue, fatigue sorry, in the first trimester and to constipation in the third trimester. Musculoskeletal complaints are commonly reported in the third trimester, as we saw in the last slide. And this is when continuing to engage in endurance activities becomes more challenging and might explain the relative increase uh, in strength training volume throughout the third trimester seen in the graph on the right of your screen in both athletes and controls. Despite the reassuring findings from this study, however, Previous studies have questioned the risk of obstetric complications in women with high exercise volumes. In that last study, none of the athletes reported high intensity training during the second and third trimesters. And it's important to bear in mind um, when you're looking at results of papers like this to guide uh, your own uh, advice to athletes to just bear in mind the exercise intensities, um, not just the volumes. In the recently published review and meta-analysis uh, by Woutzia, um, alongside Margie Davenport, two of the included studies identified transient episodes of fetal heart rate decelerations, so less than 110 beats per minute, an elevated pulsatility index of the umbilical artery which is a sign of potential um, fetal distress, sorry, a potential sign of um, fetal distress after high intensity exercise in three of seven elite athletes. The clinical significance of transient bradycardia in this small sample is unclear. Um, one elite athlete where fetal bradycardia was identified in response to high intensity exercise later developed HELP syndrome at week uh, 35 gestation, delivering a relatively small baby. Um, and in comparison, the other elite athlete who experienced the fetal bradycardic episode delivered a baby of healthy weight at 39 weeks of gestation. Chronically, a reduction in oxygen transfer to the placenta may increase the risk for fetal growth restriction. Uh, and I will go on to talk about fetal health in the next couple of slides. Um, but certainly a lot of the concern uh, surrounding high intensity exercise in athletes boils down uh, to concern about fetal health. On the flip side, Findings from another recent meta-analysis indicate that vigorous intensity exercise completed into the third trimester uh, with a maximum heart rate of 90% appears to be safe for most healthy pregnancies. Um, and this conflict demonstrates that age-old requirement uh, from, an SEM's clinician, uh, from an SEM clinician's perspective for more sport-specific research on the effects of vigorous intensity exercise in the first and second trimester of pregnancy of chronic exposure to high intensity exercise and of exercise intensities exceeding 90% of maximum heart rate. But if we're to get to the bottom of that problem, we'll also need to make note of the fact that there are a number of issues when relying on the measurement of both RPE and heart rate in pregnancy. Evidence exists to suggest that from the second trimester, heart rate, including maximum heart rate, is significantly underestimated and Borg's ratings of rate of perceived, uh, of perceived exertion, sorry, RPE, does not correlate strongly with heart rate. This table demonstrates the recommended heart rate ranges for light to moderate to vigorous activity uh, for those aged under 30 years old and those aged 30 and over. It comes from the 2019 Canadian guidelines on physical activity. And you'll note that the vigorous intensity heart rate zone uh, is set at 60 to 80 percent of heart rate reserve. It's also worth noting that if you want to use these values in practice, that they were derived from peak exercise tests in medically screened low risk pregnant women. A practical solution might be to employ the use of the SING-TALK test 
and to consider trends in heart rate values whilst also considering those physiological adaptations that occur trimester on trimester. So as I mentioned, understandably one of the primary concerns of pregnant athletes is the potential effect of training and competition on fetal health and birth weight, we know, is an important predictor of neonatal morbidity and mortality. At both ends of the spectrum, infants born large or small have an increased risk of being difficult to deliver or have an increased potential of being stillborn respectively, as well as being at increased risk of obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease as an adult themselves. The result of the Woutzia paper suggests that despite the high training volumes and potentially intensities that pregnant elite athletes are exposed to, they currently go on to have babies with similar birth weights to those of active or even sedentary controls and do not have an increased risk of either having a small baby or a large baby. Now, unfortunately, miscarriages occur in approximately one in four pregnancies and the occurrence of preterm birth is suggested to be up to 11% of all pregnancies. Unfortunately, the cause of miscarriage and preterm birth is not always known. Current research supports that moderate, moderate intensity physical activity in obstetric populations is not associated with miscarriage and preterm birth. However, the research in elite athletes is sparse. Woutzia and uh, the group all report that competing in elite sport before pregnancy does not seem to affect the odds of having a preterm birth or miscarriage. However, we need to interpret the results with caution because of the current limited number of studies. And again, we need more sports specific data. The group also report that when compared to non-elite controls and recreational regularly exercising pregnant individuals, athletes demonstrated 247% increased odds of gaining what is termed um, in the obstetric world excessive gestational weight, um, but of course is relative to their pre-pregnancy weight. Um, and in contrast with the general population who gain excessive gestational weight, this in the athletes was not associated with an increased risk of developing a large baby or going on to have a cesarean section. Of course, as mentioned before, longitudinal studies have yet to demonstrate the effect of chronic high intensity exercise on birth weight. When it comes to the effect of physical activity in general on labor outcomes, we have data from the general population that suggests um, physical activity leads to, or physical activity participation leads to reduced risk of prolonged first stage in labor and a shorter duration of the active stage of labor, which is at the point of which um, you are six to 10 centimeters dilated. And it's suggested that uh, the mechanism by which this occurs might be that exercise has an impact, a favorable impact on the contractility of the uterus. Uh, there appears to be no change in the duration of the uh, second stage of labor, which is um, commonly termed the pushing phase. But of course, we don't necessarily want to advise pushing <laughs> through uh, the second stage of labor. Uh, and that it, the mechanism by which uh, improvements or enhancements in the second stage occur uh, are hypothesized to be uh, as a result of pelvic floor muscle function um, rather than uh, uterine contractility. With respect to the effect of sport participation on the pelvic floor, it has been hypothesized that elite female athletes are more likely to have pelvic floor muscles which do not adapt or stretch sufficiently during vaginal delivery, thereby increasing the odds of having an instrumental delivery, prolonged labor and perineal, perineal tears. Uh, and although, again, based on limited literature, it would seem that engaging in competitive sport um, before conception is not associated with any of the previously, previously mentioned labor complications. 
And similarly, current data from the general obstetric population, uh, which does not, of course, include elite athletes, suggests that prenatal exercise does not adversely affect labour and delivery outcomes in that population either. Uh, and certainly further evidence suggests that elite athletes, much like the general population, experience high rates of urinary incontinence during, before and after pregnancy. Of course, further research is needed that considers the spectrum of pelvic floor dysfunction, which includes prolapse and deep pelvic pain and is, of course, sport specific. When it comes to heavy lifting, there is good evidence to support the safety and efficacy of building strength of light to moderate strength. Um, sorry, the efficacy of uh, building strength through light to moderate strength training. In the studies mentioned um, or included in this slide, uh, the dose is not comparable to the strenuous weight training performed by athletes or even some regular exercises. So the data on which we lean to support uh, the engagement in strength training during pregnancy um, does not reflect uh, the reality of training required or even engaged with in reality um, by some athletes and regular exercises. Athletes who are considering heavy strength training in pregnancy uh, need to understand that the Valsalva maneuver used during weight training precipitates a rapid increase in blood pressure and in intra-abdominal pressure and therefore may temporarily decrease blood flow to the fetus, the chronic effects of which are unknown uh, as with aerobic activity. And this needs to be guided carefully um, through modification um, to maintain a, a degree of strength and neuromuscular strength rather than um, to build and, and push PBs at this stage. Um, and, and this uh, reminds me to mention uh, helping athletes uh, during pregnancy deal with uh, their, what, what we might term their athlete brain, uh, which is conditioned to uh, perform uh, and to improve. Uh, and of course, pregnancy may not be uh, the right time to follow that mentality, but doing anything other than that might be very challenging. So um, mental health support during, during this time, whilst you're having to modify activities you enjoy, is really important. Now, the large increases in intra-abdominal pressure can also impact the pelvic floor and the anterior abdominal wall function if not adequately managed, which can contribute to symptoms associated with the diastasis of the rectus abdominis, which is absolutely normal and occurs in 100% of pregnancies by the third trimester or even pelvic floor dysfunction. There are increased odds um, of suffering pelvic floor dysfunction if lifting um, more than 20 times per week. Um, and there is no data from athletes. Uh, if you want more information about the dose associated with those odds presented, please do see the, Bar the Barricat paper. So finally, in terms of risks, elite athletes have been reported to experience a lower prevalence of pregnancy induced low back pain compared with non elite athletes, uh, suggested to be as a result of their greater engagement with abdominal strengthening and proprioceptive training. However, there is a significant difference in the reporting of musculoskeletal complaints between high performing athletes and controls in the third trimester in the Sungut Borgen paper, which I presented um, in the first slide of risks. Uh, with the athletes actually failing worse. So it seems that the evidence is mixed here. When it comes to low back pain and pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy, athletes are not immune to the potential psychosocial contributors um, that commonly factor into the presentation of this type of pain, but that may be through positive selection that they approach and perceive pain differently to the general population. Another important pain presentation not to miss is the misnomer transient osteoporosis of pregnancy, which in fact um, is represented in the above image uh, as bone marrow edema syndrome, uh, which you can see there at the femoral heads. 
bilaterally in this T2 weighted image. Um, it's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. It's pain on increasing um, of increasing intensity uh, that's exacerbated on weight bearing activity, troublesome at night and should be investigated. Uh, MRI is considered safe in pregnancy in the gold standard uh, investigation. Uh, and uh, the management uh, is supportive. So in summary, there are a number of special considerations we need to make when it comes to exercise training and the pregnant athlete, many of which I have not gone into detail about. Um, however, uh, what we should discuss is how we can best support our pregnant athletes. Since the five paper series published as part of the 2016-17 IOC consensus, there has, as I've mentioned many times now, persisted a lack of evidence available to develop best practice guidelines for clinicians and the care of pregnant and postnatal athletes, as well as women employed in arduous occupations, which I haven't yet mentioned, but are, of course, an often forgotten group in the literature. Beyond standard NHS care here in the UK, there are understandably disparities in the care available to elite athletes and service women. Organisational policies will tend to fall short of supporting pregnant or nursing athletes at competitive events or even in day to day training across the grassroots to elite spectrum. And there is no mandate of specialist medical professionals that are recommended to provide support to athletes at these times, contributing to a lack of standardisation in the current approach. And the result is that individual clinicians and athletes are often left to seek advice wherever they might, wherever else it might exist. And for the latter group, the athletes especially, this might include social media, where we are unfortunately unable to verify the accuracy um, and uh, appropriateness for that individual athlete of information shared and used. So it's really important that we start working together to provide better options. So in an ideal world, uh, this is what it would look like. You'd have a specialist MDT working with an athlete-centered shared decision-making approach spanning the preconception, pregnancy, uh, postpartum and return to sport phases. The MDT would ideally comprise of the obstetrician, SEM doc, coach, SNC, uh, coach, midwife, sports physio, pelvic health physio, uh, even the health visitor, a psychologist, a nutritionist. Now I say this knowing full well that access to an MDT, including a specialist SEM doctor, the obstetrician with an awareness of SEM and pelvic health physios is not routine practice. Most commonly, it is only in the presence of symptoms or problems that athletes will be able to access additional services at a push. Um, and this is yet another reason why our existing MDTs and our female athletes themselves should be provided with accurate information about the adaptations that occur during each trimester of pregnancy and after childbirth and how these might impact on exercise physiology so they can be supported in recognizing potential issues in a timely fashion. So how can we do this? It starts in the preconception phase. Through screening and monitoring, we want to discuss with our athletes, even before they want to make decisions about family life, um, and if we have the ability to do that, should life not intervene beforehand, um, discuss their wishes for pregnancy, their family size intention, if they're open to these discussions, um, talk about the potential effect on performance um, and timing around competition or stage of career. And these are discussions that athletes in, compar in contrast sorry, to the general population might wish to have. Um, we want to ensure that we're screening for anemia, so looking at iron deficiency and ferritin levels, um, considering the red S and ED spectrum, including and the, the eating disorder spectrum, sorry, including body dissatisfaction. And you might want to use um, some screening tools such as the questionnaires listed here. It may be important to consider DEXA scanning and looking at bone mineral density if there's any concern about bone health. Uh, because, of, of course, that's uh, very important to um, uh, bring up and uh, 
uh, treat and manage before pregnancy and um, pelvic health. Now, contrary to the traditional approaches and beliefs, it is actually possible to prevent common uh, complications associated with pregnancy, such as urinary incontinence and even low back pain. Often women will wait until after childbirth to address common complaints, even if they've occurred um, when they were null apparent, meaning that they will have become more established conditions and harder to treat. So if if we're screening for pelvic health issues or any, any features of pelvic floor dysfunction before pregnancy, we can do something about it and reduce the burden um, of the symptoms during and after pregnancy. So at this stage, we're going to advocate, what I haven't mentioned listed here is open discussion, pelvic floor muscle exercises regularly, um, and they be appropriate to the individual athletes. So whether they need to be Kegels or whether they need to be reverse Kegels um, and consideration of the core cylinder which is, again, <laughs> beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, but sometimes it's not as simple as just pelvic floor muscle exercises. Um, taking supplements such as folic acid uh, and vitamin D daily and address addressing nutrition and mental health if required. Um, well, what we're doing here is we're planning for pregnancy. In pregnancy, we want to do a lot of screening and monitoring, ideally. Um, clinical examination to rule out medical or obstetric complications or contraindications, sorry, through regular assessment through the trimesters as these can develop. Um, keep an eye on gestational weight gain and nutritional quality and ensure that there's adequate calcium and vitamin D intake um, in preparation for um, breastfeeding should the athlete choose to do that, but also fundamental for bone health. Um, monitoring training volume and intensity, internal load through um, RPE, but of course, I will mention heart rate again in a second. Uh, monitor mental health and well-being, pelvic health and the abdominal wall, and sports-specific strength. Of course, we don't have any guidelines to help us here, um, so we need to work um, within our sport or activities um, and, and to build these expert guidelines ourselves. Um, we want to advocate the avoidance of contraindicated activities, including prolonged exercise in the supine position after the second trimester and training at altitude above 1,500 feet, diving, anything that could risk bumping the bump, avoiding hyperthermia um, and heart rates uh, above 90% max for the reasons presented earlier. Um, if you're using RPE, do monitor heart rate, um, but again, consider the discussion we had earlier about the limitations of those measures. Um, I've made a note here uh, to suggest limiting the use of um, RER to demonstrate substrate and training zones. We don't uh, typically test pregnant athletes um, through cardio um, pulmonary exercise testing, uh, even modified. So um, that's currently not a recommendation uh, but do advocate pelvic floor muscle exercises um, ongoing and plan for postpartum, including breastfeeding. Um, know what your athlete wants to do. In terms of activities, you want to modify, not stop. Um, but as I mentioned before, help, uh, help any athlete who's finding it difficult to overcome that athlete brain and ensure that that mindset does not exist within the coaching team as well, um, that everybody's on the same page. Uh, that load is modified. So in terms of volume, intensity, um, and seek to maintain endurance and lower intensity strengths, uh, strength-based markers over heavy loads. Consider that positions can be modified. So um, uh, elevated positions in push-ups, dual stance for lifts, um, and lifts from elevated surfaces such as benches um, versus the floor. Consider how you might modify exposure to impact, gradually reducing this um, with the comfort of your athlete um, and, and modify activities that are impact based. And of course, don't forget the core and the pelvic floor. Um, this needs to be a balanced, balanced approach, um, not heavily focused on, but just featuring as part of any um, ongoing maintenance strength work. Now, 
women and female athletes should also be encouraged to evaluate their own risk for participation during pregnancy, so participation in exercise, sorry, using tools such as this new Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology Get Active questionnaire for pregnancy. Um, and if anyone wants the link for this, I can post it, um, which uh, has replaced the Parmex, Parmed X, which was previously used. Um, and this will help clinicians get an idea of whether or not um, a athlete needs to see a doctor. So in conclusion, exercise during and following pregnancy is established to be safe and beneficial for the majority of individuals. Participation in elite or competitive sport during the perinatal period presents additional considerations that may require modification, but every effort should be made to ensure that the athlete feels safe and supported. Special considerations should focus on reducing the risk of maternal fetal um, ill health, and management should be via an MDT, athlete-centered, shared decision-making approach with every effort made to ensure athletes are happy with the advice they are given and that they understand it. And finally, a call to action for more collaborative research uh, to inform clinical guidelines and practice is needed, particularly concerning sports specific monitoring risk and the risk associated with chronic high intensity activity. And of course, I am very interested to, uh, to work on uh, more of this should anyone else uh, have a, a shared interest. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge all the fabulous researchers working in this space, not least um, Margie Davenport, uh, Kirsty Elliott Sale, Michelle Matola, and um, Christine Sengut Gorgon. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Wonderful talk and a great way to close this evening. We've got some excellent questions coming in uh, and some common themes. Um, so, in terms of uh, delivery um, and, and an athlete, are, what's the preference for uh, elective versus natural and are there different outcomes for, for example, if you do go for a c-section, do you have uh, complications due to DRA or actually in terms of the return to play continuum for athletes, perhaps a natural birth might be more advantageous? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's actually a common discussion that's had in sporting environments. Um, I would always advocate um, ensuring that your athlete has a say and that their wishes are respected. We, we do not have enough data to guide decision making here with sport participation in mind. So I would always recommend that athletes make decisions for themselves according to how they feel and what their wishes are um, to get educated about birth and uh, some of the best ways of doing that at the moment are via antenatal courses or even hypnobirthing courses which are uh, not as hippy dippy as they sound but really educate women on the physiology of birth um, in a scientific way so really just do the basics make sure that they have a say um, and that the, if there are any obstetric considerations that need to be um, considered that an obstetrician is involved and those discussions are had with, with a specialist. So that's happening beyond the SEM environment. Uh, when it comes to postnatal recovery and uh, differences between the different uh, delivery options, so for example, the concern that if you have a C-section that you might go on to have problematic uh, diastasis of the rectus abdominis that is more difficult to rehab. I would say, again, we don't have the evidence to support um, a statement like that or any concerns, uh, and that, again, it should be guided by obstetric decision-making, by athlete preference, um, and actually there is no evidence to suggest that having a C-section, for example, increases your risk of having a dysfunctional diastasis, diastasis which, as I mentioned, is completely normal at uh, full term. Uh, and it, it, what we worry about or what we're concerned about is the function of the connective tissues of the anterior abdominal wall as part of the core cylinder alongside the diaphragm, the pelvic floor uh, and the deep back muscles. So it's a focus on individual function, um, individual potential risk factors. But again, delivery, deli mode of delivery does not seem to be 
um, a, a consideration in terms of postnatal recovery from, from a diastasis point of view. If you want to think of it from a pelvic floor perspective, it might be um, wise to have discussions about mode of delivery when it comes to pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. However, um, you must realize, and, and, and it's important to bring up with athletes, that having a C-section does not negate the risk of pelvic floor dysfunction. And we know that women who, who have C-sections also suffer urinary incontinence, for example, um, and prolapse. It's simply the physiological adaptation of uh, being pregnant and increasingly pregnant to over 40 weeks that puts a strain on the pelvic floor uh, and demands that it functions against a gravid uterus um, in the context of potentially some pelvic instability that can be common through pregnancy. So there are lots of demands uh, on the pelvic floor even before you consider mode of delivery. If, if pelvic floor dysfunction is a concern, and as I mentioned in the talk, it should be something that is screened, monitored and considered during the pregnancy phase for postpartum planning, then absolutely yeah. discussions about mode of delivery are important. Very good. Um, we've had a few questions come in about fertility. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of um, elite athletes that may have had a touch of reg or uh, amenorrhea, uh, how, what impact does that have upon their future fertility? We've got a, a lot of young athletes who want to become mothers in the future that may have concerns on that. The most important thing in the context of REDS or hypothalamic amenorrhea is re-establishing that menstrual cycle um, and demonstrating that ovulation occurs and that HPA axis is um, HPO access is no longer affected. I think if we can encourage regaining, um, most commonly regaining weight and decreasing uh, training loads, uh, regaining the menstrual cycle, demonstrating that ovulation occurs, from, from my knowledge, um, the impact on fertility ongoing it, it, it is likely to be uh, manageable but of course this is something that needs to be monitored and kept an eye on over over time and I think if you are particularly at risk or in a sport that that lends that risk to low energy availability um, and HPO dysfunction uh, then clinicians working in them in that environment just need to be mindful education of the athlete is really important um, and it might be worth seeking uh, Georgie's opinion on this as well in the in the group panel because I'm sure she'd have something useful to add as well in fact, Georgie, why don't we get um, IT to bring you in at this moment? Um, not okay. to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> anything to add to that? Um, I think, I mean, Amal really hit the nail on the head in terms of like primary focus is just trying to get that regular menstrual cycle back. Um, I think, and I'm generally fascinated by trying to understand like what it is that is driving that underlying amenorrhea or amenorrheic issue or HPA dysfunction, like is there a gynecological problem? So obviously really trying to get to the nub of the issue. Um, there's also some really interesting emerging research that seems to suggest that certain people are more predisposed to having those erratic and irregular cycles. So in terms of like trying to understand that with that individual, I would say would be important, but also thinking of the whole, of the whole holistic picture, like at the end of the day, someone is amenorrheic or oligomenorrheic because their body is saying, no, like, I'm not ready to have a child right now, unless there's an underlying gynecological problem. So um, as um, Amal said, nutrition focus, for sure, maybe reducing training load, or even reducing cumulative stress, like the stresses and all of these different, like, um, very much to Tom's talk, basic military training creates a stress on the HPO axis. So trying to manage all of those different stresses and I guess having that full holistic picture in terms of long term potential um, fertility issues, my understanding as per the research that is out there at the moment is that it doesn't seem to have a, a negative impact, um, but I think more is always needed in this space. Great. Um, a, a question for Amal then on modification and high intensity exercise. So um, the point of which um, uh, athletes continue to do high intensity exercise, is that guided by the level of a customization to high intensity exercise that they are used to prior to pregnancy? For example, you may have somebody uh, who is sort of sub elite, for example, that's um, trying to get 
to the uh, you know trying to become professional, trying to get there, falls pregnant, actually may have backed off some high intensity exercise, feels actually I want to get back into it. I know I'm pregnant. I've read it, high intensity exercise is safe for me. Can they go about doing that or or not? Yeah, that is a really good question. And I also think it's a question that's not necessarily answered by the current available research. What's mm. the impact of that initial 12 to 16 week period where most people aren't feeling particularly great? And although pre-pregnancy were accustomed to high intensity loads, um, may obviously have lost some of that um, physiological adaptation that allows them to perform at that level um, and the question of can I can I go back to doing that because I was I was doing it before and the WHO guidelines say that if I was doing vigorous intensity activity before then I can continue so I I have I have noted a lack of evidence underpinning that particular recommendation from the WHO that's available um, however what I would say is from the data, from what we know anecdotally, most athletes do not feel great in that first trimester and want to avoid high intensity activity generally. I think then the intensities become relative to their physiological state at that time. And you have to start bearing in mind the limitations of measuring heart rate zones and using RP as a measure of intensity. I think in practice, it becomes a dis dis sorry discussion about what what you're aiming for what we want to what we're trying to get out of training at this stage in life and in pregnancy generally as I said we just want to be able to maintain we really want to keep our endurance ticking over because we know we can maintain vo2 peak we can even increase vo2 max so focusing on those markers what we can do and trying to have conversations about and probing what, but why do you want to do high intensity exercise? What is that going to achieve at this stage? If you are feeling good in those zones and uh, you know, you're know you able to, to sing talk fine and you monitor trends, uh, monitor kicks after, after exercise, because often fetal kicks will decrease during exercise, but will come back after. Uh, but you know, all, all out gassing yourself, um, I would always try and talk people yeah. out of. It's, it's not the time for that. Okay, and then final question to, to all of our panelists. Then really, it's um, once once your once your mums have delivered their child, uh, have returned to exercise, have returned to competition, are they at a greater risk of musculoskeletal injury uh, uh, as opposed to pre-pregnancy? Yeah, we. I mean, I'll, I'll speak first, but we have we have data to suggest that. Uh, po postnatally athletes return quicker um, to, to activity, so generally within six weeks. Um, so that's ahead of the recommended guidance that we have at the moment from in terms of expert guidance, and that they do suffer more musculoskeletal injuries uh, upon return. Uh, and that's because during pregnancy, of course, those musculoskeletal adaptations are huge for uh, muscles to then refunction at the length that they have to shrink back down to to consider the stretch of the connective tissue and fascia um, potentially the effect on ligamentous tissue uh, the body almost has to retrain neuromuscularly um, in order to develop functional strength in those muscle groups around the core and the pelvis particularly so it's no surprise that those uh, athletes might be at more risk of injury during that time. Uh, it's that early return that we need to be wary of. And simply following the guidance in graduated return, focusing again, building endurance, building neuromuscular strength, loading up through strength, building up to impact activity, and it being this phase progression criteria based. I mean, if we're in sporting environments, this should be a be objective um, with, with clear uh, clear plans in place, directed at the athlete, um, so communicated to the athlete what's required from them to progress at each stage. Uh, and what I worry about and what I hope we will develop more guidance for um, are those postpartum individuals who are returning to, for example, grassroots sports who don't have 
who don't have that support um, and may not be guided through a graduated return. And I think we need to do more to, to publicise the availability of expert guidelines there. Yeah. Um, Great. Well said. Georgie, well, go for it. That's amazing. Um, so I guess I'll just hop on a soapbox now. Um, so I guess my my key things are um, really looking at that MDT holistic angle as well. So um, thinking about if the athlete is breastfeeding, for example, obviously that's going to increase nutritional demands. We know that actual like breast tissue will change and actually biomechanics can change as a result. Is the athlete wearing an appropriate sports bra to manage that? How about any form of urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence? Uh, obviously, have we done the um, pelvic floor work in advance, during, post, like all, all of those things need to be considered. Also, the changes in hormonal milieu that we know happen postpartum, and particularly if an individual is still breastfeeding, can of course affect um, muscle and ligament and bone injury risk just by the, the total change in the systemic kind of blood profile that an individual is going through. Um, I also think really focusing on like it, we even know that foot posture can change postpartum. So and it's well known that women's foot size can actually change. So I think um, almost having like a whole rescreen in that kind of um, process or in the return to play process, um, I think is is really fundamentally important. And whether it's a team athlete or an individual athlete, looping in the whole MDT support, having kind of regular monitoring, ensuring that you're tracking that recovery. Like I think there's so many things that can be done without kind of going overkill on excessive monitoring, but really to support that individual on the return to play. Yeah. And Amal, you've typed in the background here, the, the impact on sleep, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. That's just massive. As started, yeah. Just as you started Every talking. Every parent out there, it's massive. It's yeah. fundamental, you know, the lack of sleep cannot be ignored and it will absolutely factor in. And as you mentioned, all those nutritional issues, breastfeeding, the hormonal milieu, it will absolutely affect, um, you know, bone health. And we know that athletes returning, you know, early postpartum will be at risk of bone stress injury, yeah, hip, sacral, for example. So uh, the risks are there. We need to be aware of them. We need to know why. Um, and we need to be good at keeping our athletes, um, you know, where they need to be uh, b before sending them out off into the big wide world again. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Tom, I did have a question for you, but I'm going to ask you offline because we are out of time. In fact, no, no bugger it, I'll ask it now. In terms of your Ice Maiden, uh, your Ice Maiden challenge, uh, a couple of questions looking at uh, what happens to your athletes when they um, in the in the when they got back to the UK, uh, and did you do any uh, sub, you know post post testing at you know one month two months later after the challenge, and did they regain any kind of the body composition changes that you saw? That's a great question, Matt, and that is the most common question I'm asked about that trial. And yeah, and unfortunately not. And I think one of the big things we missed, and it's certainly not off the radar to try and do some type of follow up trial, is. Um, when you lose bone in that kind of volume over that short period of time, how quickly does it recover mm -hmm. and does it recover? Because the obvious connotations are um, linked to the earlier answers are when you're recovering from amenorrhea or, or a period of low energy availability, is it recoverable? Uh, and there's obviously some implications for pregnancy there. And just to jump on the last question, um, pregnancy is a, is a the, the bone is two, two purposes, one to for structure, but also to provide you a metabolic reservoir of calcium, of which pregnancy is obviously a clear drain on that. So we really should have followed it up to see if real rapid acute changes in bone like that do bounce back quickly, because that would answer quite a few different questions on the ability of the skeleton to kind of rebound from those type of stresses. So short answer, no, we didn't follow them up, but the, the right answer is we should have, definitely. There you go. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Uh, that's two hours, a whirlwind stop. Uh, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that the three speakers tonight were absolutely outstanding. Um, you will be able to find this uh, talk uh, on the ISEH YouTube site. Uh, we'll make sure that it gets disseminated on Twitter and Instagram. And Mal's very good at doing all that kind of stuff for us. Um, so it, 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 just, it just gives me great pleasure in thanking our speakers tonight, Georgie, Tom and Amal, and to thank you for joining us for the past two hours. We hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good evening.